Luke 15. Is that what I said? All right, let's look at verse number 11. And like I said, we're going to do quite a bit of reading this morning. I read probably to the 24th verse, and then we'll hit the ground running. Let's look at what it says. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. Do you see that this morning? All right. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. 14 says, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land. Uh-oh. And he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the, his fields to feed the swine, the pigs. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods, the food that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, thank God, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put on a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let, it, let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And this is the word of God. And the people of God said, God. amen. You all can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for standing and giving honor unto God. As we begin to look at this particular portion of scripture, we do so from the vein of our series entitled Witness. Witness. We've talked for the past two weeks about this particular series, about how important it is for all of us to be a witness, that we are to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done in our lives, that we're not to just simply keep it unto ourselves. And so in our first particular message, we talked about come and see and then go and what? Tell. And that was uh, what was preeminent in that particular message, that we're not to keep it to ourselves, but we were to tell people to come and see what God has done in our lives and then go and tell so that others can be saved just as we have and experience the life-changing power of Jesus Christ's uh, uh, atonement on the cross for us. Now, as we begin to talk about that, hopefully we passed out our heart cards. We began to invite people. Last week, we talked about who's listening to you, about how the prisoners were in that uh, Philippian jail. And as they heard Paul and Silas sing, that they heard something, that they witnessed something that Paul and Silas began to communicate and people's lives were transformed. And so the main thrust was just simply making sure that we were aware of those who could possibly be listening to us because someone is always listening. Somebody say, some, somebody's always listening. Yes, yeah, somebody's always listening to us. But today, 
will take a different track, but it's still under the umbrella of witness. Today, I want to talk to you all from the topic of the difference uh, that a servant makes, the difference a servant makes, the difference a servant makes. So hopefully you'll be taking copious notes so that you can be an impact player on the field of life and begin to see God work in and through your life this upcoming week for the betterment of someone else. Listen, when we talk about this particular text today, we find that um, our text is tailored to teach us a few things. And most of the time when we come to this particular text, we look at it from the perspective of the father or more so the perspective of the prodigal son, the son who went into a far country and he spent all of his livelihood that he had gotten from his father and he found himself to be in want and he attached himself to someone who farmed pigs and farmed the land and how he sunk to a deep and a low spiritual place, physical place and spiritual place. And then he finally came back unto himself and he came to his father. He's restored. That's what we typically think about when we look at this particular story. But I want to show it to you from a different perspective today, because I truly believe that there is a difference that a servant can make. So when we talk about this today, making a difference, I believe, is something that we all everybody say we all. We all, especially Christians, would aspire to that we want to make a difference in and through our particular lives so that somebody else's life can be a pack. And after all, sharing the gospel with people and seeing their lives dramatically changed and transformed is indeed making a difference. You know, because the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man woman be in Christ, he or she is a what? New creation. Good preaching because their lives have been metamorphosized. They're no longer living a low level life, but they're living a life where they're soaring on eagle's wings. You know, the Bible says that those who wait upon the Lord, right? They're going to gain their strength. They're going to uh, walk and not be weary. They're going to run and not faint. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And so there is a dynamic that takes place when the gospel is shared and received by someone because it makes a difference in their lives. And listen, many have heard this story many times about the prodigal son. And so I'm sure you've heard it as well, but there are, or there may be some things that maybe you have missed or maybe you did not see or really notice. And I truly believe that we're gonna see what makes the difference, that a servant makes the difference. In this particular parable, when we listen to it and we look at it, Jesus is sharing that the servants play a pretty big role in this story. You know, don't look at the prodigal son as much today or the father as much today. But what I want you to see is the role that the servants play. Touch your neighbor and say, the servants play a pretty big role today. The servants play, yeah, yeah, a pretty big role today. And this particular parable, we begin to see that oftentimes theologians believe that the servants portrayed what? Servants, they portrayed those who served Jesus. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. But oftentimes theologians, those who study the Bible, the study of God, they look at this particular story and they see the servants who are serving the father being servants of Jesus, okay? Because the father is symbolic of our heavenly father, of God. And so he has servants as well. In other words, they would be Christ followers. Everybody say Christ followers. Christ. See, and when I talk about this, they are just Christians. OK, and let me explain, because I honestly believe that there is a difference between Christians and Christ followers. Say with me just for a moment as we're going down this particular way, Ron, there is a difference between Christians and Christ followers. Listen, any believer 
can call themselves a Christian, a Christian. But most times what we find is that those who call themselves Christians are just consumers. That they're always consuming, they're always consuming, they're always consuming, but they never ever really get to the place to where they particularly contribute. Are you with me today? And I really believe that there's a difference between Christians and Christ followers because Christians are oftentimes always looking to see what they can get, what they can have, as opposed to what they can contribute to the whole of things. They operate under the banner of faith without works is dead. See, your good works are a natural product of your faith that is alive inside of you. So to not have an alive faith means that you have no work. Because faith without works is what? Dead, meaning that that particular faith is dead. It doesn't produce works, but our works should be a natural flow out of our alive faith. Are you with me today? See, we shouldn't have to work up to do anything because we have an alive faith. It pushes us into doing things. It's just the natural outgrowth of our development as Christians as we have a faith that is alive. And could it be that the reason why some Christians are just consumers is because they have a dead faith? They have a dead faith. Maybe their faith was alive at one point to be saved, but to live is dead. Are you with me so far? And so when I talk about there's a difference between Christians and there's a difference between Christ followers, that is the line of demarcation. That Christians oftentimes are just consumers and Christ followers are those who will typically contribute. Are you with me? You know, this shouldn't be too far-fetched for us because consumers are those that, you know, they're like the people that come to your Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and they eat all the good stuff. Sweet potato pie. Come on, it's just me and you today, Lo. Just me and you. Sweet potato pie. You know, those collard greens. You know, they 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 eat all of those angel eggs, you know, they eat some of the turkey, you know, they eat some of the ham and stuff. You, you know, all the good stuff. They eat all that. They eat and eat and eat. But they'll never contribute to any of it. And let me tell you, the worst ones are those who pack up plates to go. They ain't contributing nothing, no thing. And they packing up plates. Look, 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 I can go even further. They packing up plates, not just for themselves, but people who not even there. Where they do that at? At my uh, Thanksgiving dinner, that's where they do that at. Consumers. Nobody contributing. But constantly consuming like hungry hippo. Are y'all with me today? You need to know that when we talk about this particular text, that it portrays some people as being consumers and others as contributors. And so when we talk about this today, you need to know that God wants his people to contribute. Touch your neighbor and say, God wants me to contribute. Yeah, God wants us to contribute, which means that we got to have a faith that is alive and we got to have a faith that causes us to go into action. Isn't that what the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter two that's connected with our salvation? Look at what it says in verse number eight and 10. For by grace, you've been what? Saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the what? Gift of God. Come on, preach people. The Bible says, go back one, 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 one script again. It says, for by grace, you have been what? Saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the what? Yeah. It's the gift of God, right? 
We didn't work for it, but God gave it to us. Christ worked for it, and we just are the recipients of what Christ worked for. Look at the rest of the scripture. The scripture goes on and tells us that not of works lest anyone should boast. Keep reading. It says, for we are his what? Workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good work. Created for what? Created for what? And those good works are connected to our salvation. Somebody's faith not alive when they don't want to go do no work. Because the work is the natural outgrowth of someone's salvation. Can I get an amen, Savannah? I mean, that's what the Bible says, that God prepared beforehand that they should walk in. In other words, before you were even born, God already set it up that what comes and flows out of faith naturally is good works. Do you hear what I'm saying? And see, this is what God is saying. This is God's perfect plan. Everybody say perfect plan. Because somebody's sitting there saying, well, 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 and with all that working and stuff. And what you're saying is God don't have a perfect plan. What you're saying, God has missed something. But God is always right. He has a perfect plan for our lives. And we just need to get in the way. Somebody say, get in the way. way. Jesus is the way. Receive truth. And you will experience what? Life. And life more for y'all, good class. Boy, y'all been taught really well up here. Y'all faith must be alive. You see how when I talk, y'all respond? That's faith that's alive. Do you hear what I'm saying? And this is what our text is tailored to teach us this morning. Let me ask you this pointed question this morning. How many believers call themselves Christian and go to church, go to a worship service, but don't serve? Go to a church, go to a worship service, but don't give. Go to a church, go to a worship service, and they don't do anything. How many Christians operate from that sphere? Listen, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't operate that way. Remember the story of the washing of the disciples' feet that we talked about last week. Think about John 13, verses 15 through 17. Listen to how the text flows and instructs you and I about our works. For I have given you a what? Example. Jesus said, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm the leader. And let me tell you, leaders are to be the example and not the what? See, that's where we got that quote from, right here. Jesus says, I'm the example. If you want to know how to do something, look at me. And that's what you should be doing in this house. If you want to know how to do something, if you want to know how to live your Christian life, look at the leaders. Look at the ministers. Look at the elders. Look at the deacons. Look at the brand new two pastors. Look at their lives. They're the examples. Man, we talked about that last week. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So it's okay. Those are your examples. You have no excuse to say, I don't know what to do. Because they are the ones sitting there in front of you. Pull on their coattail and say, tell me how to love this way. Tell me how to forgive this way. Tell me how to have mercy. Go talk to one of the leaders. Jesus said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Treat other folk just like you want to be treated. Do as I have done to you. Don't do as you have done to me. Do as I have done to you. See, God always takes the initiative. Everybody say, God takes the initiative. And because you are God, you take the initiative. You don't give them back what they gave you. You give them what God gave you. Last time I checked, God gave me all the good stuff. Isn't that what the Bible tells us, Lo? That God has given us every good and perfect gift. That God gives us the good stuff. And so all we should be giving out is... Boy, y'all a good class this morning. Good stuff. 
Good stuff. Good stuff lines up with good works that we've been prepared for beforehand. You have been created for this kind of life. To not walk in this life is to walk contrary to how you've been crafted and created. Just like you are walking contrary to how you've been crafted and created if, if I'm a him and I'm trying to be a she. I'm walking contrary. See, it's harder for me to be a she because now I got to go get shots. I got to change, you know, uh, how I walk and stuff. It's, it's too hard. But it's easy being me because this is how I was created to be. And in the same way, you are created for good work. If any man won't man be in Christ, they are a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But Jesus says, verse 16, most assuredly. Y'all know what that means, don't you? Boy, y'all a good class. Show enough, show enough. I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent them. Y'all hear that? Nor he who is sent greater than he who sent them. There we go. If you know these things, Keita, if you know these things, the Bible says, blessed are you if you do them. Do you see the do you see the distinction? Blessed if, if you know these things, not just blessed are you. You're reading wrong if that's how you see it. It says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do these things. God is in the doing business. Do you hear what I'm saying? He's in the business of doing. And how do we know Jesus did it? Because he said, I'm your example. Look to me. Do you hear what I'm trying, trying to tell you this morning? That the text is perfectly clear. In other words, if we are going to follow the example of Jesus, we have to start by being a servant. Because he says, look at me. i have given you an example. Blessed are you if you do these things. Can you stand a blessing? Can you stand, Jackie, to be blessed one more again? Can you stand, Terriers, to be blessed again and again and again? To a certain degree, you are the, determin uh, the determiner of your blessing. If you do these things, to a certain extent, you are the governor on your own life. You know, a governor sets the limit of how fast or how slow you can go. I know Pastor Clay know this because he had go-karts. You know, people remove the governor off a of go-kart so they can go faster than they ever were meant to go. You can remove the governor off your life where blessings are concerned if you just flow in what the Spirit is saying do. Well, why you keep doing, Deacon BJ? Because that's what the words say. That's why you keep seeing blessings and blessings and blessings. God is not a respecter of persons. He wants everybody blessed. Everybody, son, you can get in on this blessing. It's just a matter of do you have an alive faith? Because faith without works is dead. But faith that's, that, that precedes works is alive. Push the neighbor and say, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. And if you read the story of the prodigal son from the perspective of watching the servants, everybody say, I got to be on the lookout for the servants. Got to be on the lookout for the servants. If you watch or hear or read the, product, the story of the prodigal son from the perspective of watching the servants, you are going to see that they played a big role. And I want to show you today, as we remind ourselves, the importance of being a witness. Everybody say, I got to be a witness. How big the servant's role was. Y'all ready for this? <coughs> Here we go. The servants had influence. You believe that, Jackie? The Lisa, the servant had influence. 
Alexia, they had Hendo. What do you mean? Look at what the text says. It's right there in verse 15 through 17. Let me just give you the backdrop because really it's in 18, but let's go through 15, uh, but verse 14, and I'm going to bring you all the way to 18, and you're going to see how they had influence. Look at what it says. But when he had spent all, somebody say he spent all. There arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in woe. Isn't that how the devil do? The devil tempts you. See, this is where I'm meddling right here, but I'm helping you. This is how the devil works. He gets you to ask your father for something you shouldn't have had because the only way you could have had that is if he had died. In other words, the prodigal son is saying, Daddy, I wish you was dead. Because that's only when you get the inheritance. But the daddy was so gracious that he went ahead and gave it to him. So the enemy working behind the scenes, getting the son to ask for what he shouldn't ask for. And then when he gets all the way in the far country, where he's a long way out from family, friends, his culture, his spiritual community, you know, doing what we do. And people who got your back, we cry with those who cry. We rejoice with those who rejoice. But he's all the way out there. A long way, because sin will take you farther than you were willing to go. It'll keep you longer than you were willing to stay, and it's going to cost you more than you were willing to pay. What happens when he's all the way out there and has been tempted by the devil is a severe famine arises. See, the devil don't tell you that I'm going to cause a famine to come on the land. He just tells you, look, man, you've been serving your dad all your life. It's about time you get what's coming to you. That's how sin is. He's deceitful. He doesn't put a gun to your head, but he works with your mind. He's the father of lies. And that's for every sin now. He'll show you the back end of it. Well, my husband ain't, you know, he not, he not, he not listening. He not compassionate to me. So now, Brother man listening to me on the job. Uh -huh. So I'm going to start, you know, talking to him a little bit more. After all, he's telling me I don't deserve to be treated the way I'm treated. I should be treated like a queen. And when I look in the mirror, I do see how cheekbones, you know, I look like a queen. So I'm start listening to him. And now just talking doesn't turn to being around and being around doesn't turn to going out and going out doesn't turn to the lights being turned off. But now when you get busted and now you lose your kids because the husband wanted a divorce and he blaming it all on you and now you got to ask for permission to see them on the weekends. That's that severe famine that you weren't expecting. That's how I go. That's just one area, but it, it, it go in all those areas. A severe famine comes up after he done got all up out there big and bad. Like he the man, he flowing, he making it rain. You can see him. He down at uh, uh, Magic City. You can see him. But it done caught up with him. His stacks weren't as long as train smoke. He thought they were, no, just a back fine scooter. That's all. But this is what the text is tailored to teach you and I. Right? The Bible says, uh, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pod. Ooh, that's nasty. That the swine ate. You know, he slobbed. Ugh. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, <laughs> he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and perish? And I perish with hunger. Look at verse 18. Catch this. I will arise and go to my father. See, what preceded I will arise is thinking about the servant. See, the difference that a servant makes. Are you with me so far? Make the cognitive connection this morning. Because listen, the message is about 
service. But I want to give you this nugget right here that will help someone. Some, the son lost sight of his identity. Got it? The son lost sight of his identity. And he doesn't even know who he is anymore. He lost sight of his identity. He don't even know who he is anymore. And listen, losing his identity causes him to go as low as he possibly can go. In other words, it causes him to compromise his value and his values. Because this is a Jewish story. He's telling this to Pharisees and to Sadducees and to scribes. And they would have gotten their identity from their parents who were Jews and from God. Now, we know he's forsaking his faith and his parents. Why? Because when he comes back, he says, I have sinned against heaven. That's God the Father, his faith, and against his father. And listen, he has forgotten his value. And when you forget your value, you will compromise on your value. Because Jews don't eat swine. Because it's not kosher. But he's not only trying to eat swine, but he's working with the swine. He's touching the swine. He's feeding the swine. Do you hear what I'm saying? He's wanting to eat what the swines eat. So this is how I know he's lost sight of his identity. And losing sight of his identity has caused him to go down. Come here, let me talk to you. When you lose sight of your identity, not that you lost your identity, because as long as you don't walk away from Christ, you hadn't lost it. But you can lose sight of your identity and you can compromise. That's where them 2 a.m. phone calls come in. You done lost sight of your, your identity, your value, and now you're compromising your values. Because ain't nothing open after 12 o'clock except emergency rooms and legs. Listen to me. I'm trying to help you this morning. Because when you lose sight of your identity, as the psalmist says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. What is man, one man that God is so mindful of him? Why did God create you last out of all his creation? Because you are the crown jewel of that creation. You are the apex. You are the capstone of that creation. He saved the best for last. He didn't give his imago day. He didn't give his image to anybody except to humanity. And we don't compromise it because we just lost sight of our identity. Lost sight. Don't lose sight of your identity. Your identity is rooted in Christ Jesus. In him we live, move, and have our being. We died with Christ. And we've been resurrected with Christ. We are seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. We're his body that houses the head and everything is under our feet. Isn't that what scripture tells us? And see, this is what our text is tailored to teach us. That's a nugget. Somebody say, that's just a nugget. That's a nugget because we ain't talking about values and, and value, really. We're talking about service. Listen, when we talk about this, I want you to understand something. Today's sermon is not about identity. But remember, that was just the nugget. So we're talking about the servants today in the story. And you know what's interesting to me? What's interesting to me is at his lowest point, everybody say his lowest point, his lowest point in life at his lowest point in life because he lost sight of his identity and compromised his value and values. Verse 17 says, but when he came to himself, somebody say he came to himself. That's how you know he had lost himself. Right. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? In other words, he remembered his time with the servants. And that's big. 
That's the difference that a servant makes. Do you hear me today? Listen, their actions he remembered, their heart he remembered, their faithfulness he remembered because servants aren't above their master. And as the master has given example, so the servants should operate in. The master has a big heart, the servants have a big heart. The master has a big uh, uh, faithfulness, the servants have what? A big faithfulness. Are you with me today? If the master has big actions, the servants ought to have big actions. And listen, without the servants even realizing it, somebody say they didn't know. They influenced his son because the moment he was so low that he came to his senses, the first thing he realized was not God. The first thing he realized was not his father, but it was the servant. Look at the difference the servant make in people's lives who are in a far country who don't know God, who have not been drawn near, who have now been made the family of God. But there are a lot of people who are far off and the servants can make a difference in their life because somebody's always listening. Somebody is always watching. Are you with me today? And see, this is what we got to understand, that we got to understand, we got to have, we got to embrace. Can I tell you, if you are being a servant, which is being a true Christ follower, you have godly influence. If you're a true servant, which is a follower of Christ, Michael, guess what? You have godly influence. Yeah. See, the servants, remember I told you the servants are looked at as Christ's followers because the father is looked at as the father, God the father. And we know God, what God the father looks like in the natural because of Jesus. Got it? He is the express image of, of God. So much so that when you Look at Jesus, you see God. When you hear Jesus, you hear God. When you see Jesus working, you see God working. Got it? And so what our text is tailored to teach us is that if you're being a servant, which is a true Christ follower, then guess what? You have godly influence. You have something to contribute. You're not just a consumer always trying to get for me, myself, and I. I come into service just so I can get. No, baby, we come into service so we can receive and be refilled so we can give back out. So that we can be a blessing. Because you can't bless somebody if you hadn't been blessed. And yes, you have been blessed positionally in terms that now you are sons and daughters of God, but we just saw that not all of God's blessings are automatic. Because if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And so our text is tailored to teach us that, listen, you have no idea who you are influencing because people are watching you live like Jesus every day. If you live it like Jesus every day, there are countless numbers of people that you are influencing, whether with the way you think, with the way you speak, or the way you live your life. You are influencing people because you are following Jesus, watching the way you talk, watching the way you walk, watching the way you interact with people, watching the way you proclaim uh, yourself to be a Christian. People are watching you. And we've got to understand this because this is important. It's big. And listen, when people you know hit rock bottom, and people do hit, still hit rock bottom. When people you know hit rock bottom, they likely will call you because you were different. You were different. They'll call you, pray for me, because they know you're different. Because they saw you on the lunch hour. Go down on the the knee. They saw you at the break time, 15 minutes. Not at the wall of cooter gossiping, but you were gospeling by reading your Bible. Giving out nuggets to people 
in the cubicles around you. Do you hear what I'm saying today? And this is what God is bringing across to us, that we are different. Somebody say, I'm different. And different is a good thing. Different is a good thing. Different is a good thing because Jesus said it was Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Let us know different is a good thing. Look at the text. You are the light of the world. A city that sat on the hill whose light cannot be hidden. Are you with me today? See, in other words, somebody needs to let their light shine. Baby, you need to shine on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What's the importance of shining? Shining doesn't make a difference unless it's in a dark society. See, the light doesn't make a big deal if it's light outside. But the light makes a big deal when it's dark. And all of us have been called into dark places. So just because it's difficult don't mean you need to catch out like a butterfly. Maybe you need to submit to God and let your light shine. Got it? You are a city that's set on a hill, meaning you're in a dark place. If you're the light of the world, how bright is your light? Because you make a difference. How bright is your light? What's your voltage? What's your watts on you? Are you a one volt and a two watt? Come on now. The Bible says being different is a good thing. It's good for you to be different. It's good for you to stick out. Because when the time comes, when somebody hit rock bottom, Job said, man born of a woman, days are few. And they filled with trouble. Somebody going to hit rock bottom. That ain't going to be me. But I'm going to make a difference in somebody's life, Sanjay, that hits rock bottom. Because I was prepared for this. I was prepared to shine, baby. I was prepared to be able to open my mouth and speak because God has given me all the information I need. 66 books and I can pick it up anytime I want to. See, this is why uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 come in. I beseech you that for a brother, not on the screen, but you know this, uh, I beseech you by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's just what flows out of you. That's just what comes without effort. That's what causes you to jump up out your seat and just do not pray. To tell God thank you. To say hallelujah. Because it's a reasonable service. It's not unreasonable to think that a Christ follower would bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. I'm not concerned about whether or not I look different. But I'm concerned about giving God his glory. Telling him. I thank him on Monday. I thank him on Tuesday. I just am so elated that he chose me, that he walked past others so he can get to the good thing in me, so I can be good to somebody else. Two says, and be not conformed to this world. Different. And be not conformed to this world. Different. Come on, help me breathe. And be not conformed to this world. Different. Different is good, baby. Different is good. Different is good. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See? Different is good. Only when you different can you manifest God's will in your life so that others can observe. But if you're not going to be different, if you're just going to be like everybody else, if you're just trying to fit in, if you're trying to look like everybody else, if you're not trying to sound different, think different, live different, you ain't going to be able to show God's will in your life. You're going to show the devil's will in your life. And what I love about this, Michael, is I get to choose. 
It's not like Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. That sloop sucker can't make me do nothing. I got a sound mind. Because I got the spirit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got the spirit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got the spirit. And the spirit of God tells me I got love. I got peace. I got patience. I got goodness. I got faithfulness. I got gentleness. I got low suffering with people, but I do have a sound mind. So I can make a decision for myself. Ain't nobody making no decision for me. I already know what decision I'm gonna do. I'm gonna swim upstream. I'm gonna be different. Y'all know y'all like Sam. Yeah. Y'all know. We gonna swim upstream, baby. We're gonna be different. Because there's a difference that servants make in people's lives who have hit rock bottom. No one lights a lamp and then put it under a basket. What? What do they do that at? Listen, a light is meant to shine. I don't know what y'all waiting on, but y'all need to be shining. You know what I'm saying? Y'all need, y- y- y'all need to be, why I'm shaking my head like this? Thing? <laughs> Give myself a concussion. Ooh, calm down. Listen, why lights a light and put it under, under cover? No, we were meant to shine. And you ought to shine. Shine, not floss. Shine. Don't co-op co-op the world's ways. Shine. Shine God's goodness through your life to others. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And as you serve the Lord with your actions, witnessing, you can witness because of your influence. Did you hear what I just said? Listen to this. This was good. Y'all can't miss this. Listen, as you serve the Lord with your actions, witnessing, that's how you're going to serve the Lord. Witnessing, you can witness because you have influence. See, you don't have influence if you're not serving God. See, because God is the one that puts the anointing on your life which brings the enablement to do what God has called you to do, which makes you have influence. See, if everybody else is just like you, they ain't got no influence in your life. You know, if you're not above me uh, uh, in terms of what we do, how we do, you know, in the things we accumulate, you don't have no influence in my life. You don't. But now if you manifesting God's will in my life, and I say, ooh, that look good right there on you. I need some of that. Hey, can you tell me? Now you got influence. See, God is the one that anoints you. He put that ointment on you. He put that oil on you like it was put on uh, Pastor Clay uh, uh, and Pastor Yolanda Clay. They shine, right? Oil makes you shine. Don't make you dull. How much oil you got on your life? Can we see that oil on you? Or are you ashy? You got flower oil on you. See, the Bible says we got to shine. You hear what I'm saying? Listen, I'm going to tell you the truth. Listen, 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 listen. When King on that keyboard, I already know we're going to have a good day. See, he's not doing this. Mary had a little lamb. Ding, 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 ding. That brother giving his all. He makes a difference in our life. He, ha- he helps to create the atmosphere for us to worship. Now, if I went over there, dead. This is going to be a dead church. Same people, same time, same place, but dead. I don't have no influence in that area. But he got influence in that area. And see, that's what I'm saying. All of us have influence. And see, that's what our Texas Taylor to teach us, that you got to understand the power of an invite. The power of an invite. How an invite can start a ripple effect in people's lives. One invite can change someone's life forever 
One simple action using your influence for the kingdom can effectively check and turn eternity in a totally different perspective in a person's life. Because you do realize that we all live. Everybody live forever. You do know that. And if you yeah. didn't know, I'm, I'm going to tell you again. That's what the Bible says. Everybody live forever. Yeah, everybody mm -hmm. physically die, except those who God decides to catch up, Elijah and, uh, and, and, and Enoch. Okay? But everybody dies physically, but everybody lives forever. You did know that, right? Even those who are not believers in Christ who die and go to hell, they live in forever. So you can turn someone's eternity living forever in a positive direction. Just by the influence that you have. Got it? Let me take the next point. Not only about the servants had influence, but the servants had abundance. Everybody say abundance. Look, verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? Do you hear that, Jay? Look at the phrase that jumps off the page to us, literally. Bread enough and to spare. Oh, look, don't, don't run over that. Do we run over words too quick in the Bible? Bread enough, mean for me, and to spare. Let those who steal, steal no more, but work with their hands so they have and that they can share with us. See? The servants had abundance. Do you hear what I'm saying? In other words, they had an abundance of food. It's literally an overflow. I'm living in the overflow. You know, that's where that song comes from. We living in the overflow from scripture. Because when you have an abundance, that means what? Overflow. Have an overflow. And this means that the servants, listen, if they had an overflow, they were serving uh, the father. Guess what? They were well taken care of. <laughs> listen to me today. Servants are supposed to have an abundance. They're supposed to have an abundance, I'm telling you. And specifically, in Luke 15, it's talking about their needs being supplied. Don't run to and fro like Gentiles do, thinking what they're going to eat, drink, and wear. Because your Father in heaven already knows what you have need of. But all you got to do is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Are you with me? The servants are supposed to. Everybody say, I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to. Now, now, now. Now say it a little street. Say, say I'm supposed to. I'm 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 supposed to have an abundance. Yeah, I'm supposed to have an abundance. I'm supposed to have an overflow, so I can help somebody else out when they are in need, when they are it hit rock bottom, and when I help them out, I can say I can tell you how you can have an abundance. So you can help somebody else out. And see, this is what our text is telling the teachers. Servants in that day and time, they didn't make very much. But the father made sure that they were well taken care of. Listen, the master in this story is God the father. And we know what God looks like because Jesus tells us that he is the very image, the express image of God. In other words, Jesus takes care of all those who serve him. Are you serving Jesus? Is Jesus sitting on the throne of your life? Or are you sitting on the throne? If you're sitting on the throne, you're calling the shots. And guess what? You got to take care of yourself. But Jesus takes very good care of those who serve him. In other words, he gives them enough for them and he gives them enough to help somebody else. See, God will always get it to you if he know he can get it through you. If God knows he can get it through you, he'll keep giving it to you. Do you hear what I'm saying? Listen, I've been in this thing for a long time now. I've been in this thing since I was 19 and I'm 51 now. And I can testify that when God knows he can get it through you, he'll keep giving it to you. Yes, he will. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that. Because that helps me to have what I need 
and helps me to help somebody else that need. See, this is what our text is tailored to te teach you. Can I tell someone in here today that thinks they don't have enough that you actually have an abundance? You just fell into excessive. But if you're a blood-bought son, daughter of God, you've been washed with the precious blood, if you've had your metamorphosis in your spiritual phone booth like Clark Kent, listen, you have an abundance. You have an abundance, but you just got to know how to access it. Somebody say, I got to access it. Yeah, you have an abundance of gifts. You have an abundance of talents. You have an abundance of time. You got an abundance of things. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your gifts? What are you doing with your treasure? Listen, you have an abundance of things. And listen, when I go look to see who God wants to bless and who God wants to elevate, I always look at time, talent, and treasure because I don't get to go home with you. I don't know what y'all do at home, but I can see your time. Do you show up at church? Are you here on time? Are you you uh, are making sure that you're not forsaking the assembly of the saints as some do. I look at your 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 uh, your gifting, your your uh, time, ta your your talent. Are you serving? Or are you just sitting down doing nothing? Are you actively looking for ways to do something to contribute unto God? But what are you doing with your finances? Are you giving it all to Macy's, all to Dillers, all to Jessica Simpson, all to he -ha -he -ha -ha, the store down there with the long hair? Uh, don't take offense. You know, I'm just trying to make my point. But that's what I'm saying. Are you giving it to everybody else and not to God? God elevates faithful people. He elevates faithful people. Don't give it all to the Africans from the motherland. Don't give it all to the Asians from the Far East. Don't give it all to the Englanders. Don't give it to them. Don't give it to everybody else. Use what you got for the kingdom of God because God wants you to access this abundance so you'll have enough to help somebody else. And listen, most people can't give and experience abundance from God because they either haven't stepped out in faith and given in abundance or don't steward what you have well enough to even see the blessing. Because some of you have the abundance, but you don't know how to steward. That's why God said in our giving, we give to God first. This is where it came from. Save for ourselves and family. And then spend towards your obligations. See, that's one of the things I taught my sons. I said, listen, before you accumulate bills, you got to make sure you got this in order. You give to God first. Don't wait till you accumulated all these bills and now you're saying, well... I don't really ham when I need to ham. Now you in a catch-22. And now you really got to step out in faith. You behind the curve, hoping God going to grade on the curve. And he doesn't. Where well, this is concerned, he already graded on the curve through Jesus Christ. Yeah, you still go to heaven, but what this life going to be like? Robbing Peter to pay Paul. What this life going to be like, right? Where you trying to make sure the water man don't cut the water off, right? See, some of us have to step out in faith, and then those of us who have stepped out in faith, then we got to steward what God has given us. We got to manage it right. We can't spend all the paycheck on the next day. I'm helping somebody. I know I am. Y'all quiet like y'all in library. But it's okay because this is the truth. Listen, some of us need to budget. We need to cut necessary, un unnecessary expenses out of our budget. Stuff that don't even matter. Some of us too broke to be listening to jazz and listen to rap, and listen to trap music, and listen to R&B. Right now, all you can afford to listen to is gospel singing. 
But you need to renew your mind. Because whoever controls the mind controls the body. And some of us too broke to be listening to other stuff. That other stuff ain't going to tell you to manage it right. So you can have more. They're going to say, come buy more of my next LP or whatever you call them. You don't need that. I'm not trying to hate on you. I'm not going to come to your car and turn the radio on knob and listen. Oh, no, not all that. But I'm just telling you the truth. This is what the Bible is trying to help us to see and understand. Can you see the abundance that God has given you? You got to be able to see that. Lastly, and we're done. Not that they had influence. Not that they just had an abundance. But they had influence and had an abundance because they served. And life change happened. Because they served and life change happened. Look at verse 22 and 24. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Life change. Because remember, he had stinky clothes on. We can infer that from the text. And put a ring on his hand. He didn't have a ring on before. Because remember, he sold everything. He, he sent it to the pawn shop. Because he tried to, you know, pay for his, uh, his charity. But it got repossessed. Yeah? And sounders on his feet. He walking down the road with nothing on. Like he in the country. And this boy come from a good family. Right. You hear me? Listen to what the text is saying. And bring the fatted calf. The father still had more. Even after he had given his livelihood to the son. He still had more. He had a fatted calf. He had no skinny, scrawny calf. Like in Pharaoh's day, them scrawny calves. No, he had fat calves. Got it? Kill it and let's eat and be what? Merry. God likes a party. That's why I like parties too. I'm going to have another party this year. I hope y'all all all invited. (laughs) For this my son was dead, but catch this, and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is what? Found. And they begin to have a party. The reason why is because the servants served, and life change happened. Because it's only when he thought about the servants that things began to turn around in his life. And if the servants hadn't been serving, he wouldn't have had nothing to draw from. There are countless number of people that need to draw from you. But you got to be in motion. You got to be serving. Because when you serve, guess what happens? Life change happens. (laughs) You want me to tell you why? I think I told y'all this before. You want me to tell you why I'm here? Part of the reason why I'm here? Because Mary had a little lamb. My mom's name was Mary. But what I remember most about her, outside of her having a sassy mouth and would tell people off if she had to, I remember the times she opened her Bible and laid it across her bed. I remember the times she was on bended knee praying, making a way for your boy. And listen, let me just go on to be transparent. My mom didn't work the kind of jobs that some of y'all moms work. And, and some of y'all were, she operated in the domestic uh, uh, category. In other words, if y'all didn't know, she was a maid. This was back in, uh, from 71 all the way up through to 2004. She was a maid for somebody. But the people she worked for, Caucasians and, and Jews, you wouldn't have known it. Because her boy was still decked out. I had everything I needed. But listen, it was because she knew how to get on her knees and pray. Because she opened her Bible. Because she took me to church every single Sunday. Whether I wanted to be there or not. And guess what? Them seeds were sown on my heart. And guess what? They did not take. But it did take. It came to remembrance when I was in a far country in Germany at the age of 19. Oh, God, duty, Lorenzo. I began to talk to my friend and say, something's not right. I'm tired of going to the club. I'm tired of drinking. I'm tired of running. 
men and women, something's got to change. The next morning, Sunday morning, we said, we going to church. Because I remembered. I remembered the environment that I was raised up in. Because she served willingly all her life. And I saw the diligence. How could you provide all this and you only made this amount of money? Well, nobody but God. I'm the ninth child. Do you hear me? Father died when I was five. So she had to do it by herself. But because she served. I'm standing here today proclaiming and preaching and teaching because she served. All other eight siblings are in the house of the Lord because she served. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? The servants can make a difference. A maid serving, underappreciated, undervalued, pushed to marginalization the servant make a difference make a difference they make a difference and God has called you into this relationship with him so you can make 